Welcome everyone. My name is Jill Eppner and I am the Director of Community Engagement with Bali. We're so excited to have you uh, join us all for this very special installment of our Community Capital um, webinar series. So we have uh, over 40 people that are going to be joining us today from all over North America. Um, we're excited to um, welcome uh, RSF and all of the folks that are dialed in from all over the place to, uh, to join us for the webinar today. Um, first thing we're going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Mikhail Davila on our team who's going to go through a, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, and then I'm going to provide a few reminders about the webinar series and then turn it over to Marian who's going to introduce our speaker for the, uh, the session. So Mikhail, why don't you go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you, Jill. Hi, my name is Mikhail Davila and I serve as the Spreading Solutions Associate here at Bali. Like Jill said, I'm just going to review a bit of housekeeping, provide a few reminders about this webinar series, and then hand it back to Jill to introduce our speakers. So if you're dialed in by phone but have not joined us in the webinar room, please find a link in your reminder email from our registration system iLink, and I will list that phone number in the chat window to the right as well. Because of the number of webinar participants, we have the phone line muted. If you have a question for our presenters at any time during the webinar, please type your question into the public chat window. We'll hold most questions to the end of the webinar when we'll have a time set aside for a moderated Q&A. If you have technical difficulties at any point during the webinar, please note this in the chat window and I will send you a private chat to help you get sorted out. The private chat will show up as a new tab to the right of the public chat window on the top right corner of your screen which will flash red once the private chat has been initiated. Immediately after this webinar, you will, you will receive a short survey. This will help us evaluate and make improvements for future webinars. Your participation is greatly appreciated. Also after each webinar, we will email all attendees and registrants a link to a full recording of the webinar along with presentation slides and a copy of the questions from the chat. Please watch for these materials in an email from me over the next few days. If you have any other questions about registration or technical aspects of the webinar, I'll be happy to hear from you afterward. And with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Jill, to get us started. Great. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, again, welcome, everyone. I'm Jill Eppner, the Director of Community Engagement um, here at Bali. Um, I really want to welcome you to this webinar. This is uh, one of our first members only events that we've had in a little while. We're looking to do a lot more of these and hope that you uh, are able to join us for them and take advantage of another opportunity to, uh, to go deeper on some of the topics that we know that are of most interest to you and also to be able to connect with other members along the way. Um, speaking of membership, if you um, have any questions outside of this webinar about your membership in general, whether it's login information, how to take advantage of more of your Bali benefits, uh, Mikhail, who just did our lovely introduction, is, is kind of our membership king. Um, so in his information that he's going to, his contact information will be in the email that he sends you. You can always reach out to any of us and, and you can certainly start with Mikhail for any questions on, uh, on your membership. Um, I want to highlight a couple things uh, specifically about the Q&A um, portion of this, uh, of this webinar. As Mikhail mentioned, um, most of our participants are, are muted uh, because of the, the volume of uh, the folks on this call. So um, in the, if you look to the right of your screen, in the public chat window, um, usually during webinars that, that, that's a spot for people to um, post questions that come up during any of the presentation. Um, and also there's usually a conversation that goes along uh, among participants in there as well. So throughout the presentation, as questions come up, we'd really like for you to submit them in there. And Marian, who's going to be doing our um, kind of moderated Q&A, is going to be scrolling through the chat window um, and pulling out a lot of questions to serve up to read at the end. Um, something a little bit different about this webinar, we have um, several of our fellows, um, our local economy fellows that are on the phone as well, and we wanted to um, give them a chance uh, to um, ask RSF some of the questions directly at the beginning of the Q&A period. And then after they finish, we're going to um, have Marian serve up a lot of the other questions that have come up in the chat window. Um, we've intentionally reserved about 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, for this topic. So um, I know there's a, we probably won't get to everything, but I know there will be quite a few questions that um, come up along the way and we certainly want to make this as interactive as possible. So use that chat window. Um, and let me tell you really quickly about our Community Capital Series and then I'm going to turn it over to Marion and we'll jump right in. So our Community Capital webinars are really focused on tools that you can take home and try out right away. Um, usually we feature a case study each month um, with some sort of a community capital innovator, someone who's developed or piloted a working model um, for connecting um, local people's investments in businesses to local needs. Uh, any sort of innovator 
uh, pardon me, would, would be on these webinars and we would allow them time to share their, their stories, what's worked and what's been challenging and also um, take time for uh, Q&A and uh, one of the, you know, certainly one of the, the big interactive parts of these webinars. Um, the series is hosted, co-hosted ironically by um, our friends at RSF Social Finance um, who have been partners of Bali's for a really long time and it's nice to have you guys actually on the webinar as presenter this time. Um, there's also advising from a wonderful group of community capital pioneers um, that are uh, listed on our website and there's underwriting support from RSF, Portfolio 21 Investments, Main Street Resources, and the Philadago Foundation. So again, the purpose of these webinars is to really be able to, be able to share tools that will work in your community um, that you guys can take back. So, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marian. So Marian, take it away. Thanks. Uh, and thanks to everyone for being on today. Um, I've been, my name is Marian Borgeson. I've been working with Bali for over 10 years, uh, most recently um, focusing on Bali's um, initiatives around driving investment, which is um, you know, kind of the, the reason for this webinar today. We're going to be digging into RSS investment options and try to make it really clear for folks on the line how to engage with the various financial um, products that RSS, RSS offers. Um, so for those of you who don't know, RSF Social Finance is a nonprofit financial institution um, based in San Francisco. And their mission is, de is uh, transforming the way that the world works with money. Uh, we have Reed Mayfield on the line today. Um, he's a lending associate there. Um, he works to identify and underwrite high impact, um, mission driven both nonprofits and for profits um, for the various products that they um, put out into the world. And he's going to discuss RSF's lending criteria and process, um, share some recent success stories, and just try to, to clarify for you uh, the different entry points points to engage with RSF so that we can have um, even more activity and connection between um, our Bali members and the range of um, um, opportunities that RSF offers through their various investment vehicles. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it right over to Reed. Um, I do want to encourage people again to, to type, in their, um, type in your questions throughout. I'll be um, some of the questions, if they're really clarifying questions, I'll ask along the way, and the rest we'll have at the end. Um, so don't feel free. So don't uh, hold back. Uh, just type in anything that comes to you, and I'll kind of moderate and facilitate as we go along. Um, so, Reed, um, take it away. Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. Um, and said, have such an incredible respect for the Bali and all the great members, leaders, uh, the innovators that have come to this holding place. Uh, to, in I guess the largest sense, make the world much better um, in many different ways through business where we also work um, and that kindred spirit is why there's been such a long standing and uh, deep relationship between Bali and RSF Social Finance. Uh, so my name is Reed Mayfield. I'm a lending associate here at RSF Social Finance. and uh, have been here about three years working as um, I guess a lot of times uh, the first person that an entrepreneur may call and talk to, uh, I help decide uh, which organizations are a good fit for RSF, um, and then a myriad of other things as you can all probably relate to uh, in an entrepreneurial role or a business role where uh, you wear many, many hats uh, even in one day. Uh, so um, more on the relationship side, uh, Don Schaefer, our President and CEO, um, came from Bali as the Executive Director prior to coming to RSF and still currently sits on the board there at Bali. Um, we're also a sponsor and a big fan of uh, just working in the community uh, with, with the leaders and, um, and members there um, and the fellows there at Bali. So today we're going to uh, delve into, uh, I guess, maybe beyond an introduction. Um, so we're going to dive deep into uh, how RSF's uh, specific functions help support uh, social entrepreneurship, uh, the different criteria in which we operate under, and hopefully give you a thorough understanding of how we can be of service uh, to entrepreneurs um, in many cases that you work with um, or otherwise that you see uh, in your day-to-day -day interactions. 
And so I'm very excited to uh, have you all here. I encourage you to ask questions as we go through the chat window, and then uh, I look forward to the Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, uh, I'll begin with uh, just a brief history of RSF um, and our purpose. So our purpose being, um, as Marianne described, to transform the way the world works with money. It's a huge, broad topic. Uh, we recently thought, can we, can we add in one generation? Uh, maybe the, the anxiousness to, to see a transformed world uh, was rising in our throats as we, we thought about that, but decided to keep it at transforming the way the world works with money. We've seen that in the banking world, um, there has been a large disconnect between uh, consumers uh, from students and children, farmers, uh, business people engaged in uh, sustainable business practices, and, uh, and the banking world in which uh, they're engaged. So we saw the, opec uh, the opaqueness of relationships in a bank and said, we want to be transparent in how we uh, operate and uh, engage with these community members as we see that it's less transactional but more of a relationship uh, that we have with these folks uh, who we have the pleasure uh, to work with. Um, whenever we say transforming the way the world works with money, it can be in many different functions. So from uh, the interactions that internally an organization has, hopefully through our relationship we can use our expertise and experience to uh, be a resource uh, for our borrowers and grantees and investors and investees to, to share our uh, experience and best practices. Um, maybe it's transforming the way the world works with money through a direct purchase of uh, a piece of equipment or a building or uh, providing working capital to an organization to support the growth and in turn the growth of social or envir environmental impact. Um, RSF stems from the fellow that you see there on your left side, uh, whose name is Rudolf Steiner, who lived through the mid-1920s. Um, and really has a lot of roots um, in many day-to-day -day things that you may not realize you come across. Um, and a couple of them of, uh, to name would be biodynamic farming, uh, represented by uh, that inquisitive cow there in the middle, and then the, um, the ever-important honeybee in the upper right corner. Uh, biodynamic farming has um, a lot of influence from Rudolf Steiner in its holistic view of creating closed loop systems or thorough regenerative uh, agricultural practices. Lower down you'll see um, what's maybe more representative of uh, health and medicine and, and cosmetics that are biodynamically based. Um, uh, and, that's, and for those of you who are not familiar, biodynamics is um, very much organic and beyond. Uh, so beyond using organic uh, materials, not only uh, are there good inputs that are coming into the system, but that system is one in which um, creates a more holistic nurturement of the environment. Lower right there represents Waldorf education which is uh, something that's grown to hundreds of schools across the United States and thousands across the world. Um, and we're a big supporter of Waldorf schools because of their uh, overall view of, of educating children. Uh, the short down version is the head, the hands, and the heart. And all three components of a children's education has to be nurtured for those. The um, History for us as an organization in what we're currently doing began in about 1984. Uh, but prior to that, we were a dormant foundation. A school burned down, and none of the community members of the school were independently wealthy and had the capacity in which to support the rebuilding of the school. Um, they came to RSF and said, will you help us uh, build the school and bring it back? We said yes, and then had to come up with um, the process of how to. And so uh, it was done through a community 
uh, pledge and guarantee community that came forth and said we can we can make this uh, amount of a gift or or pledge uh, to support the rebuilding of the school. Uh, since then, uh, we have made um, close to three hundred million dollars in loans uh, to date. It's been across the United States now. Uh, we have uh, lent not only to Waldorf schools but into nonprofits, and then about nine years ago, we began lending to for-profit social entrepreneurs. And uh, we'll we'll go into that and focus a lot on that today. So, with the three main activities of RSF, and if you see on the website, you'll find uh, more details on on all of what we're talking about today. Um, from the investing standpoint, we have our social investment fund, which is really the source of our lending capital. This is a fund that's set up so we have capital in which to lend from impact investors. These impact investors uh, through this fund have the ability to make an investment um, as an unaccredited investor or someone that um, is, is in college and has a small amount of savings or um, is making really wanting to align their values uh, with where their funds are being used. Um, this was created because going back to the opaque banking system in which we've observed a change um, uh, coming to was that this fund allows folks to see directly into where their funds are going. Uh, you can always see a list on the website of who our borrowers are and there's a direct relationship with the person that you're investing uh, through. So we also have under the investing side PRI funds. And these come from uh, foundations who wish to uh, use RSF as um, really the lender of expertise in directing funds through program related investing. And I'll go into more about that um, down the line. The impact investing portfolios are for donor advised funds as it relates to the third column on this page. We have a donor advised fund uh, program in which about $50 million at any time is invested into mission related investments. A donor advised fund, uh, the quick definition is that it's able to give folks that wish to direct funds um, the freedom to use RSF as um, a tool and a partner in directing their funds. We do a lot of the work for them in which they don't have to set up a foundation or uh, complete the, um, the lengthy paperwork themselves. On the lending side, uh, this is, this is the, the main activity of RSF. Um, our social enterprise lending program uh, has about $72 million in our portfolio right now and growing. Um, it's the main activity of RSF and the main activity in the lending um, realm of, of RSF. Um, the PRI lending uh, is, is also uh, related to PRI funds on the investing side, and I'll go into more details uh, and examples in just a moment along with the lo Local Initiatives Fund, which is a fairly new initiative um, that we began about a year and a half ago um, and um, provides uh, another kind of flexible capital to uh, entrepreneurs. On the, the giving side uh, or grant making side, we have a donor advised fund program um, in which we uh, are directing funds still within our focus areas, um, in which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, and then also the shared gifting, um, where we've come up with a unique model to help uh, really bring back into the actual uh, grantees the ability to um, direct funds and receive funds in a community or peer-based um, format. And so in this uh, approach to grant making, we take a pool of money and it's divided equally amongst 
uh, grantees. These grantees go through several cycles or iterations of the, um, the program or the initiative in which they're able to re-grant to their peers and receive other grants from those peers. And I'll send a link along after um, the webinar which goes into a blog posting to give more details here. Uh, it's really an innovative model uh, which we began several years back and are, are currently planning again for the Skagit Valley for agricultural focused uh, organizations there. The third uh, item there on the giving column is the seed fund. And this seed fund is for low, smaller organizations um, and the, this, is a, this is our only discretionary grant making program um, where we can make smaller grants of $1,000 to $5,000 uh, grants. And there's more information available on our website as well. So RSF works in, in three broad categories, uh, food and agriculture, education and the arts, and ecological stewardship. Uh, at one point we'd had a dozen different focus areas and decided con consolidation into broader categories would make it much easier to communicate with our community uh, where we work. Um, and so I'll give some, several examples of each of these uh, during the presentation here. So in, under food and agriculture, we recently went through a process to delve deep into what it means to be catalytic in who we support in food and agriculture. Because there are um, many different organizations and nonprofits and for-profits um, both uh, private and nonprofit and governmental that fall into this category, we wanted to re-examine how we can use funds uh, to be catalytic in supporting social and environmental impact. So we said if there's infrastructure items in which we can make this, uh, this, this loan or investment, that can be um, exponentially powerful uh, to support uh, transformation. So infrastructure could mean uh, processing or it can mean distribution and so forth, uh, value add um, and so forth. The next items are just several different items that came from this, from this discussion. Uh, we have our roots of course in biodynamic but have a lot of organizations that we work with who are advocating for fair trade or uh, distributing and sourcing from fair trade in organic uh, farms and farmers and distributors. In education of the arts through this, this deeper delve into how we can be catalytic, uh, we also came through with, with infrastructure, teacher training, uh, understanding that um, in a report that came out several years back um, that half of teachers change uh, their roles or uh, lose interest in, in teaching after five years. And if there was more structure and community built around teaching, uh, we would have high quality teachers that stay and are committed and engaged uh, in their roles. We also support uh, things uh, such as job training. Uh, we have a lot of work um, and organizations that we support who work with the developmentally disabled and that's uh, in different capacities from providing housing and community to job training and life sharing. Um, we also see that with the arts as being a very powerful way to uh, support learning and lifelong learning at that. Uh, there can be many forms that we can support uh, social change through artist training or tools. Um, maybe this is an uh, infrastructure item as well where, it provi where we could support an organization that's providing housing or studio space or art distribution or advertising to, um, to individuals. Under ecological stewardship, um, perhaps you'd find a lot of alignment with uh, LEED certification or uh, others in the sustainable building world. We see that um, understanding from Rudolf Steiner, uh, he spoke a lot about closed loop systems and how important that can be to our, um, our finite world and being able to replenish what is either uh, diminished or uh, what is pristine and continue it to be such. So of course uh, water being very key and then resource recovery in the built environment 
as we spend many hours of our day as individuals inside and buildings are ever present in our world, we'd love to uh, be catalytic in supporting the very sustainable practices there. So before going on, I just want to remind everyone, um, if you have questions, feel free to uh, drop those into the chat window and Marianne can um, help, help uh, pull those up to the group. So going into more of the tools for how we're, our work actually supports the social entrepreneurs and enterprises um, out there, our main activity, as I mentioned, is the social investment fund. And so these are loans to both nonprofits and for-profits that have a deep commitment to a social and or an environmental mission. And so sometimes it can be and or. Um, an example would be a group in Indianapolis, um, Indiana, who we work with and have worked with for um, just coming up on four years now called Recycle Force Inc. They're uh, committed to working with uh, formerly incarcerated individuals who have felony convictions who have a very incredible time to uh, find employment. This is um, contributing to recidivism and uh, the, the prison systems which are a large strain both on our social values and our, um, and our governmental costs as well. So they're employing this group of folks and then beyond the social value there, they're employing these folks to dismantle uh, and deconstruct and recycle all components from electronic waste. As we know from the cell phone in our pocket or the computer that we're looking at today, uh, even to the electronics in our cars, that this is a larger and larger piece of what's going into landfills. And if we can take what are uh, these toxic chemicals and also still valuable metals and pull them from these pieces that would not be used again, uh, we can recycle them and make that closed loop system there. Uh, the program related investing fund um, is for both nonprofits and for profits. The, as I mentioned, it comes from um, community foundations who wanted to take part in uh, this lending ability uh, that has been present for a long time now but has not uh, been in the forefront of a lot of folks uh, and how they think about accessing capital. Uh, the, the idea was that a foundation can lend out a portion of their funds. Uh, it has to meet these very stringent charitable tests uh, to, to go to this, this type of funding. Um, but also foundations realized they did not have the infrastructure for creating um, a loan program or, or lending right away. So they came to organizations like RSF and, and were able to, to work uh, with their funds and support both our mission and their mission at the same time. The Local Initiatives Fund, uh, as I mentioned, was a pilot for about a year, and now we've, we've put it into uh, application as of late, where we're able to take funds and use it as more flexible capital. I think we could all agree, uh, both on nonprofit side and the for-profit world, that access to capital is an ever-present issue uh, for most every business, um, whether it's from uh, finding that piece of equipment uh, for expanding your product line to uh, working capital from having misalignment from when you need to pay vendors to when you get paid, uh, or maybe to purchase space, a warehouse or, um, or storefront space. The, the, the brainstorm that went into effect that, that produced the Local Initiatives Fund was seeking to address these issues. Um, local initiatives means that it is focused on those committed to building community in their local communities. And so it's using the integrated capital approach, which means not only uh, is it available for supporting access to loans, but also gift or grant money as well. And so what that looks like is an organization can uh, receive 
a loan guarantee which could entice RSF to be able to make a loan. A lot of times the organizations we come in contact with, uh, we see amazing mission alignment. We would love to see our loans going to these organizations, but there's f financial misalignment. RSF being a nonprofit and a lender, um, we want to continue to do this. Um, and so we are sometimes our risk tolerance may not be that of venture or um, or of a, of a grant maker where uh, we can we can gift the money and um, it's not being returned back. As a loan fund, we need to see funds come back, and so that we can continue to support uh, social and environmental entrepreneurs. Um, this this local initiatives fund is also. Um, it's discretionary in how uh, we can deploy it, but we are not. Uh, there's no formal application process. Um, it, there's not a way to that we can we can open this up to the broader public in its its nascent uh, form. Um, but if you have ideas on how we can best use this, I'd welcome that conversation. So, a little bit more about the structure of RSF. Um, uh, social investment fund and how that provides the capital for our, our loan fund, our loan program. Our our funds come from about 1,500 individuals uh, who are impact investors. They're uh, mission focused, mission aligned individuals. Uh, most are unaccredited investors who have as little as a thousand dollars. This fund is um, designed so that it can be a transparent way for folks to align their values with, with their, uh, their funds. So they have insight to know that their funds are being used in um, a nonprofit in Northern California who's training teens to cook organic meals and then delivering those to um, those with terminal illnesses for free. Or maybe it's going to uh, a group that's going to large food wasters and creating compost from this, these food wastes that would otherwise go to the landfill to create uh, the gases that affect our, our earth. And see directly into where their funds are being uh, deployed. It also earns a return for the investors. Um, through this quarter that we're in now, it's 0.5% annualized. And then uh, as the funds come back into the fund, uh, and this is just a standard loan fund um, structure, we're able to re-lend those funds uh, based from the loan payments. So digging more into the criteria in which we look for, and with this I want to just very much draw your attention to um, these several points here as we go through them and also uh, emphasize that mission alignment is incredibly key to who we work with. Um, perhaps if you go on the website after this webinar sometime this week and look through um, the section about lending, you'll find an interactive map and in where you can, you can scroll through and look at folks that we support directly um, and learn more about who they are and who their communities are and who's, who's leading the charge um, for those borrowers. It's, it can't be emphasized enough that deep commitment to social and environmental uh, impact is key for who we work with. Uh, we're incredibly proud to promote the folks that we work with, and I'll go into a couple examples in a moment, um, because these, these people are incredible entrepreneurs. Um, they're, committed where they're committed in working in a space um, that sometimes doesn't always make people rich. Um, and, and they can definitely go to other places and use their incredible skills, um, maybe in, in the hedge fund world or um, the oil uh, world or something along those lines. But um, a lot of times who we work with are the proudest folks that um, we come in contact every day. It's because of our borrowers uh, that we're able to attract incredibly genuine investors uh, and make that connection directly in uh, meetings that we host every quarter. We have a meeting each quarter where we're able to invite both borrowers and investors into the room and make that direct one-to-one -one connection. Um, 
having that transparency and direct relationship has been a, an operating principle and a value of ours uh, for the longest time now. And it's, it's how we live out through our day-to-day -day interactions. So, and, and maybe I'm, I'm being a little vague on as far as mission alignment because uh, we have those three big broad categories of food and agriculture, education and the arts, and ecological stewardship. But in those categories, we're able to delve deep into those specific uh, infrastructure items or training items uh, that we mentioned before. So with alignment with RSF's focus areas uh, coming first and, and oftentimes the hardest hurdle to, to reach, um, we have a social enterprise kind of schedule that we've mapped out to try to understand, is there community being built here? And that's a large question. Is uh, their sourcing practices um, clean and, and who they, they provide um, their products to and from? So not only is it going to uh, folks that are mission-minded, but are the folks that they work with and their vendors um, aligned as well? Uh, from, from those items all the way to staff treatment and board um, and everywhere in between. So more on to the hard financial criteria. Um, there are a couple of items in which we have to see. Um, as a nonprofit asset-based lender, we look for strong collateral. A lot of times this takes the form of real estate with a school or with an organic fair trade um, packaged good company, perhaps it's a line of credit, um, or maybe it's a term loan for a piece of equipment to buy, for example, Viva Farms, who we'll talk about more uh, down the line, uh, where we help them buy uh, a tractor and, and other pieces of farm equipment um, for their organization. The other items that we need to see are three or more years of operating history. Um, that's so we can, we can get a feel for alignment with the organization and the model and how we fit in as, as far as a capital provider. We lend from uh, anywhere from 200000 up to $5 million. Uh, there's a, a subcategory for the arts where we're able to lend from 100000 and up. Um, the capital needs is an interesting item because we're not able to lend uh, the smaller amounts where otherwise perhaps uh, individual board members or, or uh, local banks or individuals are able to provide. Um, and then beyond that amount, uh, which perhaps someday we can, we can provide more, we try to work with other sustainable banks um, to, to work together and syndicate loans. So we have a strong partnership with New Resource Bank who uh, we partner with on, on loans when capital needs exceed our maximum. Uh, with an organization, we look for revenues of about a million dollars or greater, and um, with the arts, about 500,000 or more. And a lot of times with an organization that says, well, you know, I'm, I'm below this and this counts me out, we would prefer to start the conversation early. Uh, we're incredibly focused on long-term relationships and with that comes um, the first conversation. And whether that's one year before uh, we work together in a formal um, relationship to five years, uh, we always want to uh, start the relationship earlier than later. And just to remind everybody, um, please let me know if there are questions as we go. So with our lending activity, here's a, a bit of a snapshot of, of where we are today. Uh, we've grown from the first loan that I mentioned with the school that burned down uh, to about 80 borrowers and about $72 million outstanding. Um, in 2012 alone, we made $18 million in loans. Um, and today we're uh, on track to, to go beyond that amount with what's, what's coming down the pike. Um, it's a pretty even split between nonprofits and for-profits, and that's grown substantially from um, about nine years ago when we first made for-profit loans. 
Um, we also have a strong presence in education and the arts. Uh, as you can see, ecological stewardship is, is lower down there, but I'd, I'd love to see that grow. Uh, we recently, uh, in, as I mentioned, in, in having those conversations to delve deep into how we can be the most catalytic uh, with our capital. Um, we, we decided ecological stewardship was an area where we can, we can really focus a lot more attention on. Um, historically, as we come, we've come from supporting uh, schools and nonprofits, um, the education and the arts section has, has decreased somewhat as, uh, as an overall percentage of our portfolio over time. Hey, Reid, this is Mary. Just a time check. We have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, so here's just to show a few of our bar, our current borrowers, Lotus Foods uh, sources uh, fair trade organic rice and has uh, a system where they're able to produce um, much more sustainable rice as it's a huge producer of, of gases, and, uh, gases and a user of water. Um, and so we're, we're a big fan of their work. Um, Revolution Foods uh, addresses the issues of uh, school systems uh, giving children uh, low nutrient or low quality foods. Uh, Guayaquil um, is a fair trade organic uh, mate or tea uh, drink uh, that uses uh, their purchasing power to help literally help save the rainforest so that folks are not trimming the rainforest down but instead uh, selling this mate plant. Uh, here's a couple examples and I'm going to speed through these as we're we're running close on time. Uh, but these are all available on our website. Um, we've been working with, with B-Lab for some time now, and they're a Bali member, we're proud to say. So as I mentioned there on the PRI, um, there are loans of 50000 or greater. And these are for smaller organizations. I think I saw a question come up earlier about uh, those with revenues lower than a million. Um, there's no real threshold cut off there. Of course, it, it needs to be an organization that's at a, um, a revenue level that's appropriate to access or take a loan of 50000 or greater. Um, there, as I mentioned earlier, there's a charitable test that has to be met. Um, it's an IRS charitable test and it's very lengthy, um, but we can work through with organizations to see if that's a fit. And there's a snapshot of, of what we've been doing with PRIs. Um, and I mentioned Viva Farms earlier. Uh, they're a farmer incubator and training program uh, in Washington State. And you'll see Sarita there as she's a Bali fellow. Um, and she's an amazing person, an entrepreneur that we're proud to work with. They're also uh, a part of the Local Initiatives Fund and have been a grant recipient of RSFs. I mentioned this before, so um, please follow up if you have any questions um, about the Local Initiatives Fund um, because its structure is really helping access the capital. Um, we think it's going to be a much larger player as, as we grow it. It is still new in its, ex in its existence, but we're excited to see where it goes um, as it grows. And here's just a snapshot on the Local Initiatives Fund also. And here's another example of who we've worked with uh, in our Local Initiatives Fund. Their uh, common market um, works from about a 100-mile radius uh, in the Philly area, started by two entrepreneurs who um, said that access to food being a huge issue and it's something that they could, they could change. Um, so going into areas like Strawberry Mansion in Philadelphia uh, to help distribute local healthy foods uh, in schools, institutions, hospitals. Uh, and then they've grown from um, a smaller organization to a much, much larger organization in about the three years we've been working with them. And they just recently have purchased a building with our support uh, to create the Philly Good Food Lab, where they can uh, use it as a distribution point for their work, but also host other organizations who are focused on uh, the local uh, community and food access issues. 
So working with RSF has quite a few differences from working with a, a conventional bank. I think that with our experience working with nonprofits and for-profit social enterprise, we have a deeper understanding of the issues um, beyond just access to capital, but communicating with your community um, and and how to really structure your board or, or address um, uh, sourcing issues uh, and everything in between. We also, as in another example, do not employ a work out strategy, which many conventional banks do, where they seek in a down situation to um, really pull out as many resources to make themselves whole, uh, which in many cases means um, uh, liquidating assets. I think I just accidentally underlined uh, partnership versus transactional a little high, but we see our relationships with organizations as a deeper long-term relationship. Um, we are a nonprofit and bringing in more loans does not mean that we're making shareholders more happy. We are able to make more uh, social and environmental transformation whenever we're able to issue more loans. A couple of reasons why folks are not a good fit for RSF, uh, the weak or no mission fit. I said before uh, and emphasized before that this is the largest hurdle to, to cross with RSF. Um, we look for the three years. We, though we work across the United States uh, and Canada, a lot of times organizations' impact is international. Perhaps if they're sourcing a fair trade or organic uh, ingredient or food product or tea product, for example. Um, other items, and we went through this before on the financing, financing ranges, um, and then on, on the revenue thresholds as well. Um, so that brings it to the end here, and I'd, I'd just like to, to throw out the homework or the challenge to each of you, um, knowing that you're, you're deeply connect work, connected and, and in your networks and in yourselves, there's entrepreneurs who are uh, in, greatly mission aligned with the work we would love to see more of and support more of. And there's a link here at the bottom. It's rsfsocialfinance.org slash loan referral. This feeds directly to me where I can, I can see who you think would be a good fit and respond directly, uh, both to you and, and contact them. Call me or email me with any questions. I'd welcome the conversation. Uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, today and, and listening to this presentation. Uh, we're excited partners and engaged partners with Bali, and uh, I appreciate your work outside of here as well. Great. Thanks, so. Reed. Um, we have a number of questions, and we also have a few of our Bali Local Economy Fellows on the line who are able to unmute mm -hmm. themselves. Um, so we have Angie from um, Athens, Ohio, near Appalachia, Ellen from Chicago, Andrea from Hawaii, Amy from Vancouver, British Columbia, Mickey from Colorado, and Aaron from Oakland. Um, so I'm going to open it up to you guys um, first. And actually, let's just start with Andrea. Um, I see that you have a question that you typed in, but if you want to just um, ask it directly, that would be great to kick it off. Okay, hi. Um, well, my question is about startups. Um, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, and I know I do in reference to people who are familiar with RSF and seeking potential funding, is uh, what funding sources are available for startups. So if you can address that both within RSF, whether that's the local initiative fund um, or anything else or outside of um, RSF, what you recommend and what you see um, people taking advantage of if they're just in the startup phase. Yeah, it, that's incredibly a large question. Uh, you know, with access to capital being many times what I hear from entrepreneurs who reach out that, um, that they're, ha they're wondering who's, who's out there and what's available uh, to organizations. And it's not an easy path for a lot of folks. Uh, with RSF, our real sweet spot for who we work with are about the three years and up. Uh, the seed fund which we have is for nonprofits. And it's, it's not an inc it's, it can be very helpful for smaller organizations. 
uh, but it's not a large organ it's not a large amount of funding uh, and it's it's a one time funding as well um, we're we're not a startup funder and so a lot of times unfortunately we we have to turn folks to other directions um, and there are other folks out there um, who can provide more help there and a lot of times it's the community and going to to the, your local community and, and who can help. Um, I think I'll, what I like to do, and I, I have several folks on a list from my just personal research um, that I've done for, for startup funders out there. Uh, and it's not a long list because it's not a world that uh, we work in um, currently. But um, if if you could maybe email me with a couple of specifics for a specific case that you have in mind, I can try to try to make a connection there. Um, just to add to that question, we we had an earlier question just typed in about this question of three years of history and revenues um, of a million or more. And you mentioned that um, it's helpful to start to know as early as possible about prospects. So if you're getting towards um, that threshold, um, it's good to start the relationship early. But what, what sort of information is especially helpful to you to be able to assess whether or not in a year, for example, um, an enterprise might be an appropriate fit? What sort of, um, I don't know, both um, data about the company or information about their mission, but what would you be looking for to kind of capture attention um, so that you might uh, maintain a relationship that would then ultimately lead to a loan even if they're not at that size yet? Sure, and this is probably um, directed also at, at other folks uh, that could be potential uh, capital partners um, from individuals or board members or uh, community members out there. Um, and I think that with with those deeper connected community members, they will want to know um, what your impact is if they're not already familiar. Why is it important for them to get involved and and provide funds for you? Um, what is the mission or what is the issue that you're affecting in what you're doing? Um, whether it's maybe distributing local products and helping them understand what's the real economic value that's returned to the community that they can they can directly understand. Uh, speaking clearly, both. Speaking on behalf of ourselves, um, but also what others would um, would be curious to know as well uh, if you're going to them. That's the biggest hurdle with us. With um, the financial side, we we want to see that there is a thorough understanding of the financial model. We have a lot of organizations who operate very differently and have a broad understanding of um, what works and, and what may not work. Um, so we want to see specifically that there's a management team going a level, a level back um, on that question. Mm -hmm. So we want to see that there's a management team that has that experience and acumen to produce reports that are, are accurate and also um, they can back up with the anecdotal information as well. A lot of times folks will want to see a business plan, and we would too, uh, especially with uh, newer organizations that are around that three-year mark because a lot changes with an organization in its early days. It's almost as if you can find what works and what's your, your sweet spot, and then you can build upon that. And structurally, not a lot may change. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, I, sh I shouldn't generalize the items because an organization uh, can make large changes um, over time uh, just to be adaptive and innovative. Um, and so we want to see that there's a full set of financials that are available and easily accessible as well. Uh, it's kind of a red flag if you ask for financials. And um, of course, if they're written on the back of a napkin, that's, that's, that's a huge mm -hmm. no. Um, but if, if we can see that you're using QuickBooks or Quicken or whatever internal system you have, or perhaps it's, it's an Excel spreadsheet, but we can see that items are very thoroughly listed out uh, and, and accurately reported. Uh, many times we ask for three years of operating history. 
uh, a forward-looking budget of, of one to three years, uh, and perhaps a biz business plan of whatever is available. Um, it's also mm -hmm. helpful to be able to show how you uh, budgeted for a year and then came close to, and if not, why? Um, mm -hmm. Because that shows that you had that forward-looking uh, ability to, to direct your organization. Um, Great. So yeah, I think that kind of reporting information or package, um, just to reiterate, would be three years of financials and a forward-looking year to three. Um, if it's for a line of credit, we'll of course want to look at um, your accounts receivable and how well you're managing your relationships with vendors and customers. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Are there other fellows who would like to ask questions verbally? In which case you can do so now. This is Ellen. I have a question. Hi, Ellen. Great. Hey, guys. So I, Rita, I was listening to you talk about how you fund resilient local economies, but then I was looking at your list of the categories in which you fund, which was food and ag and education and the arts and environmental stewardship. And I was sort of trying to figure out how and if um, other kinds of economic generators fit into RSF's portfolio outside of food and agriculture. Like for example, if shared workspace or business incubators or you know, work in low-income communities um, you know, that may have an educational component, may or may not have a food and ag component, but are very much about economic generation, if that, if that fits in anywhere. Absolutely. Um, an example would be with uh, the arts. So we've been, um, we've, we're finalizing today actually uh, a loan with LA Stage Alliance, um, who does a lot of the back end work for uh, about a thousand performing arts uh, organizations in LA, and they they do those things that are not flashy and not something a lot of times an artistic director or sometimes even an executive director is able to um, really have the skills or experience to do. Maybe it's customer relationship management or advertising or ticket sales. And that's, that's a form of economic generation um, because it's, it's supporting that, that back-end infrastructure items. Maybe more specifically for individuals, it could be on the artistic side. So we've identified those items in that deep delve, excuse me, on that deep delve of, of where we can be more catalytic and uh, said with, with artists, um, you know, Etsy is even an example that most people are probably familiar with. It's a platform for people to sell their creations. And so if these are artists who um, have a trouble finding distribution and an outlet to sell their, their wares and their, their works of art, um, perhaps that's an, an area where we can support economic generation. Does that, does that answer your question? I think so. I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that it, that it very much is resilient local economies within, it does need to be within the arts and within education and within food and ag and not, there's a whole world of resilient local economies that are outside of those things. But Yeah. yeah our, our focus area is being broad. Um, there's a lot of items, job training uh, mm -hmm. falls under education. Um, mm -hmm education and it's in itself is very large and broad and so we take liberty to be flexible with that definition. Okay, so it sounds like it's worth having a conversation with you about sort of flexible ideas within that. Yeah, please, Great. please send me an email and I'd love to, to chat. Okay, thanks. Great, we had another, oh actually first, is there any other fellows who'd like to verbally ask a question? But I, uh, this is Angie from ACENET. Um, I'd just like to, uh, I know I, I had heard some of the folks from your organization talk about how they um, uh, decide on the interest rates that you charge. Um, looking mm -hmm. at the loan side as well as the PRI, can you describe kind of what those rates normally are? Sure, sure. And so our rate currently, we have a prime rate, um, which as of this quarter, and, and it's a variable rate as well, is 4.5%. Now, maybe I can just describe a bit more about how that rate's set because it is community set and community-based pricing. Um, I mentioned 
earlier um, that we have a quarterly meeting where we gather investors and borrowers and we move it around uh, the United States so that more folks have an opportunity to engage in this conversation. But we, and this also stems from Rudolf Steiner's teachings of economics, um, saying that when you're in a transaction, both sides of the table have identified their needs um, and in an ideal transaction and the highest transaction um, that both sides' needs are met. And so we set our rate and have been doing so um, uh, for I, th I think it's four four-ish years here now based on this conversation. Uh, previously we used LIBOR uh, which we see is very disconnected uh, from uh, local merchants or children learning or farming uh, sustainably and so we said we can we can take a rate um, that's not connected and instead use a rate that is directly um, designed for and and directed by the folks that are actually using it. And so it's variable. It does go up and down, but it is designed to move more slowly and with more intention uh, behind it from those that are using it. Um, we also, it's adjusted from there. And so um, for it's risk adjusted as well. And so we, it's not every rate is 4.5%. It's usually reserved for um, an organization that has strong collateral and has um, a great uh, track record or something along those lines. And so a lot of uh, organizations do not pay just the 4.5%. Um, but we also are very competitive with, with other folks out there. And, and what, what about the PRI? Is that the same, you hold the same rate for that as well? That's usually close to the 4.5%. That's, it's because it's usually with nonprofits or with very nonprofit-like uh, for-profits. And so um, that they usually are uh, receiving the lowest rate that we can, we can do. And maybe just add a bit more on why it's that 4.5%. Uh, for transparency, the as I mentioned before, um, as of this quarter end coming up, uh, the rate for investors who receive um, who receive this rate it's for, it's 0.5% annualized. The other 4% is what we have determined in our budget allows us as a nonprofit to operate and and have earned revenue to be almost completely uh, self-sufficient in how we operate. Great, thanks. thanks. Any other questions from fellows? Okay, then a few other questions from the rest of the folks. Um, Reed, remind us, is do you have preference for California-based companies, or what's the geography, and is there preferences within that, that geography that you serve? Sure, sure. So we work uh, across the United States and Canada. Uh, we have a very large representation of folks in California. Um, just from uh, our base and roots here, um, but also we're very excited to work in places where we're not. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe it's in, in Arkansas or South Dakota or, or Nevada where we don't have um, borrowers and we'd, we'd love to, to help support organizations there too. But there's no, though we support local organizations and local economy uh, building, we are uh, domestically focused, so across the entire United States and Canada. Um, mm -hmm. It's those that we work with that we see as building those local resilient co economies. Great. Great. And then do you have advice or resources for Bali networks who may have members, business members within their networks about how to connect with you? What information um, could network leaders on this line provide to their business members to um, to make a good connection that would lead to um, investment in those businesses? Any thoughts on that? Sure. You know, I think the kind of the the talking point there is that we're going to be the the best mission aligned uh, lender available, and that we also have other resources and networks that we can provide. Uh, to the folks we work with. We see it as a, a longer-term relationship. 
uh, where we can share our expertise and resources and not make it transactional. We're also uh, looking for organizations that are three years uh, in operating history and also have uh, somewhere around that million dollars uh, for our main loan fund um, and lower for the PRI. But mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of items that I'm going to send along um, after we're done here today, which can be forwarded on. And those great. would be great things to just pass on. Of course, picking up the phone with me is, is, is very welcomed. I'd appreciate the conversation. Great. So network leaders can kind of give their members a sense of, of uh, the requirements that, that you're looking for, provide your contact information and, and the link to the referral form, but then also um, the materials you're going to send go into a little more detail for borrowers. Is that right? You got it. Okay. Great. Um, another thing that came up during your presentation was this idea of a pledge or guarantee. If you had a borrower that didn't have you know, the, the most robust collateral, can you say a little bit more about what that means and maybe give a few examples of what that would look like when a community or, or some sub-segment has actually pledged or guaranteed support a loan to an organization that you might not otherwise have been able to serve? Yeah, sure. And it, that goes back to that origin story where the school had burned down uh, and there was not, uh, of course the school had burned down and they could not take a loan on a, on a burned down school or access a construction loan or, or there was not an individual who could make a private loan. So they banded together to uh, build a pool of funds which could, they could pledge payments and pledge a guarantee for uh, RSF and they were able to, to make the loan from there. Um, we still do that today. Um, we do it with nonprofits or our schools for for profits as well. Um, a lot of times it's it's back to the that larger question of access to capital. If um, there's not if it's an organization that's leasing space has um, maybe accounts receivable um, or inventory that's not a general type of inventory that unfortunately we couldn't lend much against, that makes it really hard for us to be able to be the lender for that matter, other other lenders as well. And so mm -hmm. a guarantee or pledge community can be very valuable in that aspect. It's a big ask though uh, to go to your board or uh, that secondary or, or tertiary uh, level of community and say, will you support us by putting some of your money, uh, quote, at risk? And so um, we've, we've helped with organizations to um, provide educational conversations about uh, what that means for guarantors or pledgers. Um, mm -hmm. A pledge community can take the form of um, maybe perhaps we can see that over three years there's been uh, 10 people or 30 people that have said, I will pledge $1,000. Um, a year or $5,000 in the beginning or any variation, and that's the schedule that we've made out uh, for loan repayment. Um, mm -hmm. We think that's a very impactful for access to capital because uh, we can be flexible in that way where other banks cannot. Uh, with the guarantee community, it's really bridging that gap from where uh, we could not make a loan to where we could. Uh, mm -hmm. And we do a lot of work with our borrowers. Uh, just recently, as I mentioned, LA Stage Alliance, we built a, a guarantee community of, um, of about a dozen folks who are very passionate about supporting the organization. And so um, they've, they've helped the organization and us be able to make that connection for, for accessing capital. Great. Wonderful. Well, we're just about at time. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jill to just close us out. Uh, Reed, I want to thank you so much for your time. And also I want to thank um, Catherine Covington at RSS who also helped with uh, preparing this presentation. So I really, really encourage all the folks on the line to connect with RSS um, and also to make ideally a, a pretty um, direct announcement to any members that you know of, your, your own business members that may be able to benefit from uh, this type of um, financial investment um, with some of the materials that we'll send you from Reed that give more information for potential borrowers. Um, so with that, um, Jill, I will pass it to you. And thanks again, Reed. It was a really great presentation. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks so much thank to everyone here, and, and thank you, Bali. We, we really appreciate the space and the, and the time here. Thanks, everyone. This was, this was great, Reed. We really appreciate it. Um, so just a, a couple of housekeeping items for the rest of you guys. We, uh, uh, everyone who's registered and is on the call now, you guys are going to be receiving an email um, that has a link to the, all of the presentation materials. You'll get a copy of this webinar, and we'll have all of the other goodies that Reed is going to send over, um, some great resources in there that we will um, include for you as well. You'll also get a link to be able to listen um, to this, this webinar again. Um, you, you can also purchase some of our past recordings of webinars at bealocalist.org. And one of the best ways um, to keep conversations going and to be able to connect with other Bali members and your peers um, are something called our Bali Affinity Groups. And this is a, this is a, um, a peer sharing kind of listserv that's, that's limited just to our leader and champion level members. And there is wonderful peer sharing questions that people ask and kind of discuss amongst themselves. There's great conversation. And we have one that's specifically focused on community capital um, uh, topics. So uh, everyone that's um, on this call, we're going to go ahead and um, add you on to that affinity group and you can start to, um, to pose topics and questions to the rest of your peers and get some great answers. Um, great information back from all these other folks doing this kind of work. Um, you guys will also receive after the call an email with a link to a short survey. We, we take the, your feedback really seriously. Um, we're designing a lot of our webinars for um, the next several months. Uh, coming in um, September and October, we've got some webinars around pop-up retail, um, uh, also some DPO, um, more uh, direct public offering information. And then as we think already for the holidays, um, we're going to be collaborate. Bali is going to be collaborating again with Amoeba for the Shift Your Shopping campaign. Um, and we've got some great information about that. So there's a lot of great stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, but Reed, Catherine, thank you guys so much for your time in putting this together. And we hope everyone found this to be a very helpful and useful, resourceful um, hour and 15 minutes that you spent with us. And uh, we look forward to um, connecting with you guys on the affinity groups and with some of our future webinars. So thanks to everyone for their time. And have a great rest of your Tuesday.